All right, we are back for another week and another episode of SDA's React. I am Dr. Jason Thomas. I'm in the driver's seat today because these guys don't like driving. And I'm here with Dr. Randy and Deontay. How are you passengers doing? I'm good. Yeah. I'm, oh, so, I'm you, good. so you admit that you're a passenger, right? Is, is, that, is that what this is? I have no problem being a passenger, bro. <laughs> have Miss Daisy all day. No problem. <laughs> I'll take it. All day. All day. No problem being in the back seat. Quick fun fact about Jason. Jason drives two and a half hours upstate all the way to New York City every single day. So Yeah. That so is he's used to being a driver. Okay, great. He's used to being the driver. <laughs> But it's nice to have a vacation once in a while, no? All right, so next week, Randy, you up. Anyway, that's another right. behind-the-scenes discussion. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to have you here with us. Sister Yvonne, hey, how you doing? Um, Louis, good to have you here. Uh, Bible Vibes, always a pleasure. Jim, hey, from, from Canada? Huh. Wow, that's pretty cool, cool, cool. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, and hey, Larry's here. Larry's in the house. So today is part two. Hey, Stefan. Today is part two of what we were talking about last week. It was, um, hey, Mark Anthony, one of my favorite people in the world, by the way. Today is part two of what we've been discussing um, about the seventh day of this church. Is it biblical uh, response to need.net? And so this is part two. Hey, Keone, good to have you here. So without further ado, I think we should just start and pray, right? And get right into it because there's a lot to talk about. You know, this video, he he got some heavy hitting, heavy hitting questions in this video. So let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for allowing us to be here at, on this beautiful evening where we are in New York and to be here with my friends and um friends in the, in the chat and everybody who's watching, I pray, God, that you will be with us tonight, forgiving us of our sins, filling us with your Holy Spirit, and being the speaker for tonight, being the teacher. Make everything very plain from your word so that we can understand you, understand your word better, and, and draw closer to you and love you deeper. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, oh, divine good to have you man divine you you said an inspiring thing to us we made a little short based on the message we put in that last stream so we definitely yeah. appreciate you divine for you know your support and your you know your remark to us and um all right so for those of you who are new what we do here is we respond to videos if there are videos on the internet that you would like us to respond to please email us text us do whatever you can to get it to us we will respond to them in time but the whole purpose of this show is never ever to bash anyone but a lot of people say seventh day adventists believe this and believe that and we're just here to set the record straight um and so what we aim to do is show biblical reasons of why we believe what we believe show official statements you know we go straight to the 28 fundamental beliefs we live by those here we'll go to straight to the spirit of prophecy a lot of people take things out of context so if we need to go to spirit of prophecy or the writings of ellen white we go there do it in context that's what we're all about okay we're not just speaking off the top of our heads here but we want to make sure everything that we say is what's written what's officially stated and all these things because people misunderstand misinterpret overlook certain things and so we're here to just share um things and set the record straight and share what we know all right guys yep yep all right let's go <laughs> great soul sleep the adventist church teach that you don't have an immortal soul so if you die you're asleep until judgment day now the bible does speak about people's bodies sleeping but never about someone's soul sleeping the bible even speaks in revelation 6 about these people who were killed for their faith in jesus and they're already in heaven and they're asking god O oh, sovereign lord holy and true how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth they're not asleep if they're speaking there is no soul sleep number four mm. all right 
so that is the accusation. He says the Adventist Church teaches that you don't have an immortal soul. So if you die, you're asleep until Judgment Day. I think, uh, yeah, that is something that we do teach. But there's something that I want to correct. And I know, Deontay, you're about to go in. But he says, now the Bible does speak about people's body sleeping, but never about someone's soul sleeping. This terminology here, I just want to, you know, set that record straight that Seventh-day Adventists, I, I don't believe we use that term soul sleeping. Like that's and so the thing about some of these terms is that when you hear critics talk, they'll say Seventh-day Adventists believe in soul sleeping. But these are not terms that we use. Like what we try to use and what we aim to use is terms that the Bible uses. So if the Bible says soul sleep, we'll take it. But the mm -hmm. Bible doesn't use that term soul sleep. So the first thing I just want to say to this gentleman is don't box us into a belief that we don't officially say. Now, if, if it's on our official website that we believe in soul sleep, fine. But these are not things that we actually say, but we go with what the Bible says. But Deontay, what do you have for us? Yeah. Um, so I want to share a little something with you all. Uh, here's a little PowerPoint that I made. Um, one second. So on this little PowerPoint, can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says the state, of, state the dead. of the dead. Right. So when we think about the state of the dead, I like to divide this Bible study into these five parts. <clears throat> okay, so what is the state of the dead? So first we have to look at how man was created how was man created so the bible says then the lord god formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils what the, the breath, of, breath life. of life and the man became a living soul yeah interesting interesting so the bible says that the body plus the breath of life equals a living soul mm -hmm. now we had to we have to first state that foundation because now we're going to go into what actually happens when you die mm -hmm. the bible says in genesis 3 19 in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return then shalt the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto god who gave it people look at ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 and say see when you die your spirit goes back to god so now you're a disembodied spirit floating around in heaven but let's look a little deeper let's look at james 2 26 it says for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of god is in my nostrils. So Job actually says that the spirit of God was in his nostrils. What is the spirit of God that Job was talking about? He's talking about the breath. All the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God in my nostrils. So what actually goes back to God? The breath of life, which the Lord gave. Let's move on. Let's move on. What does a person know at death you know some people say that oh we're disembodied spirits when we die floating around and we're in heaven looking down upon all the things that are going on on earth but psalms 146 verse 3 to 4 begs to differ it says put not your trust in princes nor in the son of man in whom there is no help his breath goeth forth he returneth to his earth and that very day his thoughts perish. Yes. So what happens the moment that you die? The Bible says that your thoughts perish. Moving on. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. Probably the clearest verse on the state of the dead. It says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. They have no more thoughts no more emotions. Neither have they any more a portion forever, forever in anything that is done under the sun. 
So they're not interacting with this world anymore, nor do they have thoughts or emotions anymore. Let's move on. Let's move on. What is a soul? So what does the Bible say about the soul? So we already know that the breath plus the body equals a living soul. But let's look at it, let's look at it a little bit deeper in Genesis 2, 7. It said, then the Lord of God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. <clears throat> that word soul. The word soul is the Hebrew word nefesh, which also means life. So a lot of people don't know that the word soul, it just literally just means life. Nefesh, a soul, living being, self, person, desire, passion, appetite, emotion. Now, the word soul can also be translated as feelings or disposition. For example, this is what Matthew 26 verse 38 says. It says, then saith he unto me, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. So the word soul can also translate to feelings and it can also translate to disposition. Mm -hmm. Last point on the stay of the dead. Are souls immortal? What do you guys think? <laughs> Are souls immortal? Only Christ. As a mortality. Who only has immortality? Who only has immortality? Dwelling in the God. light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, also, also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth shall die. So are souls immortal, brethren? Or do souls die? Souls die. They die. Clearly. Souls die. Only Amen. God is immortal. Mm -hmm. Only God is immortal. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it for this PowerPoint. So shall we move on? Yeah. All right. So I think that was nice to us for us to get a foundation about what a soul is, right? Because a lot of people believe that souls are immortal. And I think that last verse that you clearly showed shows that only God has immortality. And immortality is um, a gift that God gives to the righteous at the second coming. As a matter of fact, let's see that. Oh, by the way, you had a question here, Keani. I mean, from Keani. He says, Yante, what is the source of your definition? What lexicon are you using? I believe he was using the Strong's Concordance. Uh, if we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, um, when we see that in the Strong's, Strong's Concordance. Concordance, yep. It says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed to his nostrils and the breath of life and man became a living soul h315 that's where you get this definition from in the strongs nefesh and how we see how nefesh is being used we could see 416 times it's soul but then the other times that it's used in the bible 100 times it means the word life um it could mean souls or it could mean lives it could mean the person himself person heart you know, this is where he gets like um, emotions and things like that, or disposition, mind. So yeah, yeah, these I'm are all the different the ways in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, these are all the different ways that you could see how the word is used. Mm -hmm. But and of course, I don't want to read all of this, but yeah, Strong's has a lot of ways how that verse is being used, how that word is being used in the Bible. So yeah. Um, you know, it's very important. Oh, I wanted to show also when do we get an immortality? I think that's from um first Corinthians chapter uh 15, mm -hmm. right? Nobody is an immortal soul. It's first Corinthians chapter 15. Yep. Um do you remember what verse it was? 51, I think, around there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here it is. Yep. It says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. So even he understood the dead are called sleep, but we mm -hmm. shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At when? The last trump. At the last trump. That's when Jesus comes back. For the mm -hmm. trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised 
incorruptible and we shall be changed for mm -hmm. this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mm -hmm. mortal must put on immortality so we only have immortality at the last trump i haven't heard the last trump yet so that means nobody has immortality <laughs> that means everybody Amen. is just dead sleeping in an unconscious state um not knowing but waiting no not knowing anything but waiting for the second coming so yeah. that answers that question about you know what happens when a person dies now he brought up revelation chapter six he says you know there are souls in heaven you know is that what revelation chapter six is really talking about understanding that um you know the dead know nothing the dead don't go to heaven until the second coming <laughs> How do we explain Revelation 6? Well, the first thing that we need to understand about Revelation 6 is that it's in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation has some rules from the very beginning or a disclaimer from the very beginning. It says, and, oh, wait, hold up. In the very beginning of the book, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and did what? And signified it. Mm -hmm. He signified it. What does signify mean? Yeah, he made it symbolic. Yeah, he put it in signs and symbols. Right, Randy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. You don't sound so sure, brother. Is, is, is the book of Revelation a symbolic <laughs> book or not, brother? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, it's a symbolic book. Anyway, so we're going to have a Bible study with Randy later on about this. But me and Deontay are on the same page. God, <laughs> Jesus yeah, Christ. On the same page. <laughs> Jesus Christ signified uh, this book. So the book, the thing that you see in this book a lot, are a lot of signs and symbols, right? And so we should understand that there's figurative language. For example, you might see in Revelation chapter five, you might see like, you know, a lamb, you know, a lamb that was, that had been slain, right? But then when you realize who the Bible says in previous places, who the lamb is, you understand that, oh, this is another way of saying jesus christ and so it would be no different in revelation chapter six there are symbolic language in here and we have to understand what it says in other places of the bible to get a comprehension of what the idea is being said and you guys should notice that if we look at every seal right you'll see at the top revelation six is talking about the seven seals when you look at the very top you'll see that like where the each seal where I guess where the focus is of each seal, like where is the location? And you'll notice that every seal that is open, something is happening on earth. On earth. Yep. Let me give you some, you know, some proof. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as if it was a noise of thunder, one of the four be saying, come and see. And I saw and behold, a white horse. And he sat on him, had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Right. So this is something that's happening on Earth. Right. You see a white horse conquering. Right. When you see the second seal is open, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat there on to take to take peace from where? The Earth. Right. So the second seal mm -hmm. is about Earth. Maybe the first seal, you might say, oh, that might be a horse conquering somewhere else. But definitely the second one is definitely on Earth. Right. And when well, he had opened the third seal. Conquering heaven. How would a no horse idea. be conquering what, heaven? It would, it would be earth. I, yeah. <laughs> and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in hand. And I heard a verse, voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see mm -hmm. thou that not hurt the oil and the wine. Right. Mm -hmm. These are things that are on earth. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice from the fourth beast saying, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed him with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of what? The earth. Mm -hmm. The earth to kill um, with mm -hmm. sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. So mm -hmm. now when we're seeing this, we're getting this idea that all of these things are happening on earth. Now, this is the, the seal in question, the fifth seal. But before I go to the fifth seal, how about we look what happens when he opens the sixth seal? Is this a continuation? And behold, when he opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great what? Earthquake. Right. It's not a moon quake. It's not a Jupiter quake. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's happening on Earth. It's an earthquake. Right. 
And even when he opens like the last seal, right? Revelation chapter eight. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. Why would there be silence in heaven? Well, the Bible tells us this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Mm -hmm. One amazing event is going to happen that would make earth very, very empty. I'm sorry, make heaven very, very empty. And it's this event. When the son of man shall come in his glory and all the angels, the holy angels with him. How many angels, y'all? All. We don't know how many, but we know it's all the holy angels with him. Then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his uh, sheep from his goats. So we understand that even when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with all the holy angels. And this is why mm -hmm. we understand Revelation 8, the sixth, seventh seal, to be something that's happening on earth. Heaven is emptying out because Jesus and all his angels are coming to the earth. So now, if we understand that each one of the other seals are focusing on something in earth, why is the fifth seal focusing on something in heaven? It should be something on earth. So let's like a look, have a closer examination of what's going on in the fifth seal. Mm -hmm. So it says this. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So he's seeing souls that are under the altar. Mm -hmm. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, does that now judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should do what? Rest. Now, I find this to be very, very odd. If you're in heaven, why are you being told to rest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yet for a little season until their fellow servants are also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled right mm -hmm. so this is very very odd and so we understand that in the fourth seal there was this huge persecution there was a lot of souls slain and then we're seeing in the fifth seal that there are souls under the altar that were slain and they're given white robes and they're told to rest. So that should strike you as odd. Why would somebody be in heaven being told to rest when this is a place of never getting weary, run and never get weary, like walk and never tire, you know, those old Hindu songs, right? And so mm -hmm. we understand that this is symbolic language. When they're told to rest, we understand that Jesus helps us to understand what it means when a soul or a person is resting. John chapter 11, uh, when they're dead, rather. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then he said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Right. Mm -hmm. So the Bible makes it very, very clear when you're being told to rest, that means you're actually dead. These people are dead. But I want to also tell you something. You know, is there a scenario in the Bible where a soul that was slain or somebody that was slain can still speak, even though that they're dead? Yes. Sense, yes. Yeah. What do you think? What, what, what comes to mind? Cain and Abel. Abel. Cain and Abel, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is, and this is why we should understand that when you're under, when you're trying to understand Revelation, you have to know other parts of the Bible. When we look at uh, Genesis chapter four, right? Jesus, God said this to Abel: If thou doest well, thou shalt not be accepted; and if thou doest not well, sin life at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt have rule, right? Mm -hmm. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So Cain killed Abel. And the Lord said mm -hmm. unto Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother is what? Blood. blood. So blood has a voice? Mm. But yet, 
It says, the Come voice by. of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So this is an example of someone that was slain, but the blood is crying out from the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that one more time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, notice that it says crying out from the ground and not from out of heaven. Amen. Mm. But I'm going to share with y'all something very, very interesting. Oh. Something very, very interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. Notice it says the blood cries. Now, in Revelation 6, it was souls that were crying. Right? When will you avenge us? But this one says blood is crying. Is there a connection between blood and soul in a yeah. symbolic sense? Well, yes. Well, mm -hmm. let's check this out. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. Notice what it says in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. You know, someone said it in the com comment section, it was Stefan. <laughs> it must be a very big altar. Check this out, Stefan. Check this out. This is pretty cool. Was there ever a situation or something that happened under altars in the sanctuary? Leviticus 4, verse 7, it says this. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock where? At the bottom, the bottom of the altar. A burnt offering. At the bottom of the altar. What was being poured in the bottom of the altar? All the blood of the bullock. So now we see all mm. the blood of the bullock is being poured on the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door wow. of the tabernacle of the congregation. Do wow. you see where I'm going with this? Of course. We see that these That's souls are under the altar. But when we actually study the sanctuary message, we understand yeah. what was actually placed under the altar. The blood. Mm. I need to get now. In. I need to get in. Now. How does this make? Hold on a sec. Hold on a second, preacher. Hold on a second, preacher. Let me land this plane. Yeah. Why? What does the blood represent? It says this: for the life of the flesh is Come where. Come on. In the blood. Yeah, yeah. The mm -hmm. life of the flesh is in the blood. Why is this significant? Because. When you look at the word life, H315, what is the word life? Nefesh. And on, what preacher. does nefesh mean? Come on. Soul. Soul. Come on. Wow. Come on. So in the sanctuary, what was actually being placed under the altar and what did it represent? Blood, Blood. but it represented soul. It, life, it was soul. exactly. So when God is saying wow. your brother's blood cries to me, it's another one saying the blood, the life of him being slain. It's not saying that he's a living, breathing soul. No, this is symbolic language. But these things are all connected. So when we understand that the life of the flesh was in the blood and the blood was being poured out on, on, under the altar, we could take that understanding and go to Revelation chapter 6 and say what this is really saying is that people and a soul is a person souls and the like lives were being destroyed mm -hmm. right and their blood is under the altar and yeah. so mm -hmm. we could also understand that the altar really represents the earth where our lord was slain did you want to get well, into that Randy? well yeah um, the altar doesn't represent necessarily the earth my brother it represents um it represents the uh the cross where Christ was sacrificed, but also where it's the, it's the outer court that represents the earth in a sense, right? I think that's more of a better representation. I wanted to actually touch on it real quick because a lot of times we kind of have this issue as far as whether it's heaven or earth, so on and so forth. Now, you already bought a Revelation 6 verse um, uh, 9 to 11 where it talks about the blood crying out. I'm, I'm going to keep this really quick because, you know, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. So I just want to bring you to a few verses. Go to Exodus chapter 27, real quick. Exodus 27. Now, we're talking about the sanctuary. Look what it says. Exodus 27, verse 1 and 2, it says, Thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Hmm. Interesting. Go to, mm. go to actually uh, Exodus 30, verse 18. Exodus 30, 18. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
He says, thou shalt make a labor of brass. brass, foot also of brass, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So where were these two pieces of furniture found? Yeah, in the outer court? Is that what it's called? In the outer court, exactly. Right? And this is why it's done between the um, the altar, which is the altar. When you walk into the gate of the sanctuary, you have the altar, then you have the labor, and then you have the door mm -hmm. to the inner court, which is the holy place, and then the holy place right after. Um, Amen. don't want to stay long, but look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. Look at Daniel 10, verse 6. I want to point something out to you. I think it's a little um, interesting to note. Daniel 10, verse 6. Look what it says in regards to speaking of the body of Christ. It says, his body was also like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like and colored to what? Polished what? Brass. 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 We see the same thing. You don't have to go there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. So when anytime, so it's very funny that when, when Christ had Moses build a sanctuary, the two or the, the two um the two pieces of furniture that was in the outer court, he made to be brass. But when it spoke about actual the physical mm -hmm. attributes of who his skin was, it was brass. So once we see this, we kind of see that this 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 outer court experience or the altar or the, the altar of sacrifice and the labor represents the furniture that was surrounded with the earthly ministry of Christ. So it could not be talking about a heavenly one because when you see brass, you can see clear connection to Christ's humanity, and it's only talking about the earthly ministry, which is why, again, the altar birth offering, offering which is brass, was where John said, behold, the Lamb of God was, was taken away the sin of the world, which is where the altar of sacrifice represents the cross as well as far as Christ's ministry. The labor represents, of course, new birth, which is water. The resurrection before he now goes into the heavenly sanctuary. Something else I want to point out to you before I end this thing. Go to Revelation chapter 21, verses 18 and 21. Right? So it says the building of the wall of it was Jasper, and the city was what? Pure gold. Like unto clear gas. Go to go to verse 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, and every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was what? Pure gold. Pure, Pure gold. gold. As, as it were so not only was the city glass, but the street was actually gold. I'm sorry, not, not only was the, was the city gold, but also the street was actually pure gold. Why is this important? Because if you actually go to uh, you know, the Exodus chapter 25, right? In fact, go there real quick. Go to Exodus 25 real quick. Exodus 25, go to verse 10, right? Go to verse, look at this. It says, and thou shalt make an autumn of shittim, shittim wood, two and a half cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure what? Pure gold. gold. Right? So this is talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Next, go down to verse 23 and 24. Thou shalt make a table of shittim wood. Look at the 24. Thou shalt overlay it with what? Pure gold. All right. So now look at also um, verse 31. I'm sorry. 31. It says, and thou shalt make a candlestick of what? Pure, pure, gold. pure gold. So did you notice that this in the inner court, it was always talking about pure gold, but anything in the outer court was talking about brass. Now, why is that important? It's because it was to separate the actual ministry of Christ. The brass represented the earthly ministry of Christ, while the gold, yeah. which we saw in Revelation 21, represented the actual heavenly ministry of Christ, which is why in Revelation 1, when you see all the way down to Revelation 11, you see him walking around in the holy place. But we know in the holy place, the furniture that was therein was what? Was what? It was gold, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the furniture in the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the most holy place was, was gold. So the whole point that I'm trying to say, it could not be talking about a heavenly ministry because at the end of the day, the only time that blood was spilt was done in the altar sacrifice which represented the earthly ministry of Christ. And the actual metal of the actual furniture helps you to better understand that as far as the location is concerned. I'll stop right there. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well said. So let me just 
uh, just recap. So everything that we said. So when we're talking about those souls under the altar, when you understand that that word soul also means life, right? And we understand life was in the blood, right? That could very well be translated. Blood was under the altar, just as Abel's blood was crying out to God. I want to give a couple more reasons why we know this is symbolic and why we know that actual people are not in heaven right now. Well, except for the ones that the Bible mentions, but the resurrection or the, has not happened yet. Um, and people are still waiting for the resurrection to come. There are a few verses that we could definitely look at um, just to put a, a into this uh, discussion. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter four. Notice what it says in First Thessalonians four. These are things to really look carefully at. It says, but I would have I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are what? Asleep. Asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus did what? Now, what did he do first? Help me out here. What did he do first? He died. He died. He died. And then what? He rose again. He rose again. So what's the order? If we believe that Jesus died first and then rose again okay. second that's the order he died mm -hmm. and then rose again even so them even so them also which sleep in jesus will god bring with him what does this mean when it says even so them also it means in the same manner so jesus. exactly what jesus did the order that jesus did yeah. Is the order that those who sleep in yep. Jesus will do. Yeah. Which means the order is this. We die and then we rise again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it says this. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus, meaning those who are dead, will God bring with him? Will. Mm -hmm. Does yep. that mean that God brought them already? No. Or God That's will future bring tense. them? This is a future tense. So mm -hmm. just as Jesus died and then rose and then went to heaven we die we will be resurrected and then god will bring us with him does that mean that we're in heaven now no when we die no. immediately no. no for this we say unto you that by the word of the lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the lord shall mm -hmm. not prevent them which are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So the order is this. When we die, we wait for the resurrection. Then we go to heaven, right? Yep. And I'll show it one more way, and then... This would be the ultimate study guide on just re that Revelation chapter six. So don't ever say that. We never talked about it very, very thoroughly. John chapter 13, Jesus also tells us this order. He says this, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, Jesus is saying in this verse, I am with you. You shall seek me. He says, yet a little while I am with you. You will look for me. Yep. And I said unto the Jews, whither I go, what? You cannot you can come. come with me. You, you cannot, cannot come. Mm -hmm. So how can there be all souls under the altar? If he's saying you can't come. Right? How and then there's verse 36. Be, Simon okay. Peter said unto him, you know, Lord. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see what you're doing. Okay. Lord, whither goest thou? Oh, yeah. Jesus answered oh, yeah. him. Mm -hmm. Whither I go. Thou canst follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Come on, come on Dre. Come on. Where is Jesus going that we can't go with him now? Take it he easy. says this. Let God. not your heart be troubled. Oh, Believe man. in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. Close if it were there. not so, I would have told you. Oh. I go to prepare a come place on. for you. Come on. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, second oh, coming, mm -hmm. and come receive on. you unto myself, oh, so. that on. where I am, there you may be also. So oh, Jesus man. is making it very, very plain that 
we can't go with him until the second coming. Notice in his father's house is, is many mansions. How are these people confined underneath an altar? Do you know how tight an altar has to be to be confined underneath that? How does it make sense that these people are in heaven under some altar when there's a mansion that they're supposed to be in? Come on. The reason why is because it's symbolic language. When he's using mm -hmm. those words, he's basically saying these souls represents the blood of those that were slain. As Cain's blood cried out, and remember, the life, the nephesh, the soul, that same word, the life is in the flesh. And so these mm -hmm. souls is representing the blood that was spilled as Cain's blood. And God is going to put his vengeance on that. Nobody is in heaven until the second coming of Jesus Christ, except for Amen. the people that God mentioned. So, Amen. Amen. Jamie is saying, set the context in John 13, 31. See, when Jamie talks, I got to listen to Jamie. So <laughs> this is the context. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart, depart. out of this world I love that. unto the Father. So mm -hmm. this is why I listen to Jamie when he talks, having loved his own. So the context yeah, yeah. is him about to go to the father. And he's on, plainly dude. saying, I'm going where my father is. You cannot come right now. So yeah, yeah. Does that answer yeah. that question? Amen. So. Let's move on. Annihilationism. Seventh-day Adventists believe that hell is not eternal conscious torment, as the Bible says. But instead, they think that unbelievers will simply be annihilated. They'll cease to exist eventually. But that really downplays hell. It makes hell not too bad, then. Going extinct in hell is exactly what an unbeliever would want anyway. It's what atheists were expecting, right? But it's not what is going to happen. Because it doesn't fit with the biblical texts, such as Revelation 14, which speaks about people having no rest, day or night, and the smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever. The smoke of their torment can ascend forever and ever because they must be being tormented forever and ever. Number four. Oh, my gosh. This is terrible. Uh, I'm going to repeat. I'm going to repeat what he said, man. I'm going to repeat what he said. Adventists believe that hell is not eternal conscious torment, as the Bible says. Where does the Bible say that? It is. But it said they think that unbelievers will simply be annihilated. They'll cease to exist eventually. But that really downplays hell. It makes hell not too bad. You know, some people really believe that hell is not too bad already. And so I'll just have a barbecue with Satan and all the hot devil girls all eternity. So which one is actually a hotter hell? The one that you could have barbecues in or the one that actually can destroys you completely? And I think Doug Basher said it best. <laughs> Our hell is hotter than your hell because it completely destroys you, right? But mm. <laughs> let's talk about it, guys. Are the wicked burning forever and ever and ever in hell? Or do they be, are they going to be destroyed? I have some verses. Hmm. I have some verses. Too. Matthew. All right, cool, 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 cool. Matthew chapter 25. Let's look at this. Let's notice what it says about hell. <clears throat> then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye curse into everlasting fire. Mm -hmm. Prepared for who? The devil and the his angels. The devil and his angels. Yeah. You know, I should have said this even before going there. Y'all, y'all know that verse John three sixteen. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I heard What's of John three sixteen about. I heard of it. Let me yeah. go to John three sixteen. That's John a beautiful state of the dead verse. It says this, John three sixteen. This should be the first verse when talking about what happens when you die. It says, "For God so loved the world." That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish. Perish. But have what? Everlasting, everlasting life. life. So there's two choices. Believe in Jesus, you get everlasting life. You don't, you perish. What is perish? What mean? this man is. <laughs> okay, let's look it up. I mean, I'm unfortunate because people may think that, I, I don't know, he's got to make sure. G622. Yeah. It's okay. Perish, right? It means uh to destroy fully. Oh, that's why I wanted to bring it up. 
That's exactly. To destroy fully. So what is You're being fully what, destroyed. What is God talking about? Mm. I don't, I don't right? understand. Look, to put out of the way entirely, entirely. abolish. Come on. What they think the law is, abolish. Come on. Put an end to uh, ruin. Render come useless. On. To kill. To declare that one must be put to death. Yeah. That's what perish means. Right? And so... How can you say that the wicked are burning forever and ever and ever when Jesus didn't even say that? In order for you to burn forever and ever and ever means you have to be alive forever and ever and ever. But the mm. Bible, Jesus himself says, you will perish. You won't be alive forever and ever and ever. Right? Mm. Now, let me go back to my original point. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Who was hell prepared for? It says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire. Prepared for who? The devil, the and, devil and his angels. Okay. <clears throat> what is going to happen to the devil? And get burnt up to a crisp. Let's look at it. Ezekiel chapter 28. And we can go to Ezekiel. Let's look at some verses, maybe 14 to 19, right? Talking about mm -hmm. Satan. If you don't know about Ezekiel 28, it's talking about Satan, right? He's called the king of Tyrus, but he's really talking about Satan. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. This is what happened with Satan. He was a covering cherub in heaven. He was perfect until iniquity was found in him. Yep. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, wait, how can you sin without a law, by the way? That's another topic for another day. But he has Yikes. transgressed the law of God somehow because it says he sinned. Therefore, mm -hmm. I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will what? Destroy thee. Destroy thee. O covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. Oh. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Come on. Thou mm -hmm. hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall do what devour thee devour thee what is going to happen to satan devour it up he's going to be devoured to the curse. and Destroy. i will bring thee to what ashes. ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee mm -hmm. and they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee why thou shall be a terror and what Never shall thou be anymore. That looks like wow. his existence is completely evanished or erased. Yep. Like, so he yeah. said Seventh-day Adventists teach annihilation that they will cease to exist? The Bible, Jesus is saying hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to exist anymore. Mm -hmm. How can we survive that? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> we can't the devil's not going to survive the fire of god mm -hmm. there's more i'll give you a few more right we can go to malachi chapter four let's go to malachi chapter four. Oh, mercy god keep going all right let's talk about it malachi chapter four for behold mm -hmm. the day cometh that shall burn as an oven this very day is going to destroy completely destroy satan and uh -huh. and all the proud yea, and all that do wickedly shall be what Stubble. 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 And the day that cometh shall burn them yeah. up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it leaves neither root nor branch. Come There's on, nothing that's going to survive for them. Right? Verse 3. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. You want another witness? Let's go. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 says this. Ezekiel 18, verse 4 says Behold, all souls are mine. Who do souls belong to? God. God. Who makes the rules for God. them then? God. God. As the soul of the Father, also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall what? Die. Die. So he's saying immortal souls? No. Only God have immortality. 
all souls are gods and the soul that sins dies. It's very, very simple. How about this? I, Isaiah chapter, I don't know, chapter 10. Let's go to verse 16, right? Isaiah 10, verse 16, it says this. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, sin among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory shall he kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Uh -huh. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. God is going to be the flame. The Holy One is going to be the flame. The Holy One is Jesus, by the way. He's going to be a flame and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both what? Soul and Soul body. And body. Mm -hmm. So what's being destroyed? Everything about you. The Bible is very clear. Whatever you think soul means, we believe it means light. Everything about you, the soul and body, is going to be destroyed. Yes, that's right, mm -hmm. Jamie. Neither root nor branch, right? Nothing will be left of you. As, as a matter of fact, Psalms 37, verse 10. Let's look at this, and then I'll be quiet for a little bit. But you can't keep me quiet for long, because <laughs> I'll tell you why later. Uh, Psalms 37, verse 10. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. The wicked shall what? They not shall be. not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place. What does this mean? And it shall not be. You shall diligently consider. Where's the wicked? Where's the wicked? Oh, they're burning in hell for all eternity. Nope. Mm -hmm. God is saying, whatever thought you're thinking about the wicked, if you think they're burning in some place called hell for all eternity, you shall diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Why? Because the wicked shall not be. Uh, Jamie Russell's favorite verse. I got this from you, Jamie. Shout out to you, Jamie. You're the man. Uh, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 16. There's only one chapter. So verse 16, Obadiah. For as you have drunk mm -hmm. upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and look, and they shall be as though they had not been. That, that seals it. So he says Seventh-day Adventists teach annihilation. They teach that they will burn up and cease to exist. All these verses are where we get it from. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Pastor, yeah, what I, you got for me? <laughs> I want to add on to that. I want to add on to that, right? Can we? So we talk about how Satan is going to be destroyed in hell and the wicked are going to be destroyed in hell. But there's another, mm -hmm. there's something else that's going to be destroyed as well. Can we go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14? It says, and what was cast into the lake of fire? Death and hell. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So death and hell, and that word hell just means the grave, because God is not throwing hell into hell, right? So death and the grave are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Isn't that interesting? Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 26? Yeah. It says, the last enemy that will that shall be destroyed is what? Death. death. But where is death going to be destroyed? In that lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that interesting? So the Bible says that death is going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. Yeah. So if we believe that that hell is a place of unending torment, doesn't that mean that death is going to continue to live on for all of eternity? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make any sense. What does Revelation 21 verse 4 say? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and yeah. there shall be no more what? Death. Death. Whoa. So you mean to tell me that death is going to cease to exist when it's thrown mm -hmm. in hell? So what do you think is going to happen to Satan and all of his wicked followers th that are also thrown in hell? Doesn't that mean that they're also going to cease to exist? Just like how no death ceases to exist? When the yep. Bible says that God throws death into hell, what the Bible means is that God is going to cause death to cease to exist. Mm -hmm. It's going to be no more death. And now, here's another thing. 
where exactly is hell going to be? Because some people think Earth. that hell is going to, it's this underground dimension where Earth. people are continuously destroyed or continuously tormented day and Earth. night, day and night. But let's go to Revelation 20, verse 7. Mm -hmm. It says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of what? Gog and Magog. The four earth. quarters of the earth. Oh, my bad. Right? <laughs> four quarters of the earth. <laughs> four yeah, quarters yeah. of the earth. That's right. right? The earth. To, yeah. gather, <laughs> to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9. And they went up to the breath, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? Devoured them. Devoured them. Come and on, devoured yeah. them. So it means that it destroyed them completely. But where are they being destroyed? On the on earth. of the earth. They're being uh. destroyed on the earth. But what does the Bible does the Bible say that the earth will burn forever? Let's go to nope. um, the very next chapter, verse one. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had done what? They were passed away. They yep. had passed away. So does the Bible teach that the earth will burn forever, or will that burning pass away? Will the old earth that we're living on right now pass away? A guy will create a new one. So if we know that this old earth will pass away and that the burning happens on earth, how then is the burning going to be continuous forever and ever and ever and ever? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, going along with what Jamie said in that um, verse in Obadiah, I love Nahum 1 verse 9. Hmm. Talking about affliction. Come on, preacher. Come on. Nahum 1 verse 9. The Bible Come says, on. What do ye imagine against the Lord? Come he on. will make an utter end. Affliction shall not Nahum rise God. up the, the second, second time. Come on, preacher. Come so on. you mean to tell me, how is it that there are going to be people that are burning, having eternal torment in hell? But the Bible says that affliction will not rise up a second time. Doesn't that mean that affliction will continue if they're not dead? And you want to know what this doctrine, why this doctrine of um, eternal torment in hell? Do you want you guys want to know why it's so demonic? Mm. Because that doctrine teaches that man created a problem that God could not solve. That's what it mm. teaches. Come on, preacher. It, it teaches on. that man created a sin problem, and that that sin problem is going to be here for all of eternity. And that because God cannot truly them, solve that sin problem. But is that the plan of salvation? Of Come on. If he doesn't get rid of them, the problem continues. The problem continues. That, that's really what it teaches. But the plan of salvation mm. teaches us yeah, that yeah, God yeah, wants yeah, to get yeah. rid of sin from the entire universe. That's the plan of salvation. Mm. Amen. Amen. You know, when you said, when you said that, it, it reminded me of Genesis chapter 3. That very first lie um, that Satan said, and the serpent said unto woman, to the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, this is really the heart of this whole thing. Do you die or not? God said, don't eat of it, lest you die. And serpent said, you shall not surely die. So what we're seeing is this doctrine that Satan preached from the beginning is in the church. And people are believing this stuff. That wow. your your soul is immortal, that you won't actually die, that you'll live in fire, and that makes God so sadistic to be torturing a person steals a bubble gum and unrepented sin or whatever like that for a short lifetime, maybe you know how long is a lifetime? Eighty years? That a gazillion years? He's still burning from something he did in such a short time? Eighty years? Is that just? Right? Our Shut own up. justice system is not like that. Come on, preacher. Come on. You know? Like you eventually have a, 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 a sentence and then that's it. You've served your sentence for the error that you did. 
but God is sadistic? That anyway, let me answer that question though. So he he said that uh Revelation chapter 14, you know, this is one of our favorite messages, the three angels' messages. But he's saying uh that this teaches that Satan is going to um be burning. I'm mean, sorry, God is going to be burning people forever, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's take a close look at it. It says this, and the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And here's where they get it from. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. So you see, Jason? They're burning forever and ever. And they also, Jason, they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and its image and whosoever received the mark of his name. So you see, Jason, it does say that they burn forever and ever. But let's talk, take a look at some of these points. Verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his ignition. And he shall be tormented where? With fire and brimstone, where? Help me out here. In, in the presence, in the of, the presence of the holy angels. Yep. And in the presence of the lamb. Do people realize this? God is going to allow people to just be destroyed forever and ever and ever and ever in his presence, in the presence of the angels and in the presence of the Lamb? Is God really going to do that? Nope. Hmm. Where sin can't even survive in his presence? Seriously? Wow. And then it breaks the whole Revelation 21. I'm like, how is that not going to be sorrowful? Watching the smoke of people's torment while you're in heaven clearly there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth but this is all happening in the presence of god this don't make the new sense. earth is also in the presence of god because it says the yep. lamb and god are the light of it right we're going to be yep. living with him so yep. these people are going to be burning in god's presence on the new earth forever and ever randy i mean deontay already showed that this is happening on earth yep. again revelation is a symbolic book and so when you want to understand what revelation means you have to go to other places in the Bible and see where the same story is told. Now, where is this story told in the previous parts of the Bible about how the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no day, uh, they have no rest day or night? Where is this language taken from? And so I'm going to share with you what I learned from Edwin. Edwin is my teacher on the low, yeah. I learned a lot from Edwin. So it's on Saturdays, if this is a commercial, come on Saturdays at 5 p.m. Edwin, he uh, he should be here tonight too. Edwin, if you're watching, just just sign on. But anyway, <clears throat> this is what I got from Edwin, right? When we look at where this was taken from, it comes from Isaiah chapter 34. Notice what happens in Isaiah 34. Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is in therein, the world, and all things that come from it, forth of it, right? For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury mm -hmm. upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. So this is something about God destroying. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. This language is in uh, Revelation chapter 6. And from all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf faller from off the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword, God's sword, shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia, which is basically Edom, right? And upon the people of my curse, basically the wicked. Yep. To judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. Yep. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats and the fat of kidneys and of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with, uh, fat with fatness. So we see God is destroying, right? For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Mm -hmm. And the streams thereof shall be turned into 
pitch and the dust thereof mm. shall into what? Help me out here. Brimstone. Brimstone. And the land thereof shall become what? Pitch. Become burning, burning, pitch. Pitch. burning pitch. So what do you need for burning? Fire. Fire. So now we're talking about fire, right? Look what it says. It shall not be what? Quenched day Quenched nor night. night. Mm-hmm. This is language from Revelation chapter 14. The smoke thereof shall go up how long? Forever. Forever. Right? So we're seeing what God did to Edom is what he's doing in the last days. Mm-hmm. Is Edom still burning mm-hmm. today? No. 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 But it says it won't be quenched night or day. The smoke goes up forever. Come on. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it. How long? Forever, Forever and, ever. and ever. Come on. Really? Really? Mm-hmm. What happens next? But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Hold on. Wait, animals are possessing it? I thought this place was burning forever and ever. Come but on. now animals are living in it? Come the on. owl also and the raven shall what? Dwell in it? Well, I thought it was burning. Dwell in it? And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. So what we're seeing is there is a restoration. God is saying Edom is going to be destroyed. He's saying the fire is not going to be quenched forever and ever. The smoke goes up. But yet we see animals living in it, and it's not burning today. Mm-hmm. This is how we need to understand Revelation 14. Revelation 14 is quoting Isaiah chapter 34. And basically what he's saying is he's going to destroy them. They're not going to find relief from this qu- destroying until they're completely destroyed. But then after that, there's going to be a, re- a restoration. Mm-hmm. And this is what we see in the book of Revelation. We see in uh, Revelation chapter 20, there's fire. Everything is destroyed. It's not yeah. quenched night or day. But then mm-hmm. everything is going to be burnt up and yeah. then there's going to be a restoration. Life yeah. is going to go back in it to possess it. So, no, we can't say that this is in the literal sense burning forever and ever because it's not happening. It didn't happen before when he said it. And this is only pointing to the future. So this is how you have to understand the book of Revelation. I'll share with you a couple of more things. Uh, when you go to Revelation, another thing to consider in Revelation chapter 14, it says this. Uh, the smoke of their term- torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, right? Notice it says the smoke of their torment ascendeth mm-hmm. up forever and ever. It doesn't say the smoke of their tormenting. It's just the, mm. the smoke of their torment. Mm-hmm. But what does this mean? Is this quoted in another place of the Bible? Yes. Psalms yeah. chapter 37, verse 20 mm-hmm. says this. Where are you? But the wicked shall what? Perish. Perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as a fat of lambs. They shall what? Consume, consume. into it's smoke. Small. They shall, shall consume small. away. Come on. So it says the smoke ascends up forever and ever. Oh, but what on. does that smoke represent? Them consuming away. And this is the same chapter that says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. So Mm. then, what is this talking about? They're going to be completely destroyed. We have to understand the word forever does not mean forever in how we say it today. We have to let the Bible tell us what forever means. When we understand what forever means biblically, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How many days? Three days and three Three, three nights. nights. Three Mm -hmm. days and three nights. But when we Mm -hmm. look at Jonah, chapter 2, verse 6, how long was he in that fish? I went down to the bottoms of the mountains and the earth with her bars about me forever. Mm -hmm. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Forever in this context means three days and three nights. Let's see forever in another context. 1 Samuel chapter 1. This is what Hannah said. It says, uh... But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide, how long? Forever. 
Forever. What does she mean when she said forever? She says it. Therefore, also, I have lent him to the Lord, and as long as he liveth, Come on, preacher. He shall Come be on. lent to the Lord. Come on. And he worshiped the Lord there. So when the Bible is saying the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, we have to also understand that forever means as long as you live or until a certain time. Right? And of course, in the context of burning up, it's as long as you live. These mm -hmm. people are going to be completely destroyed. Yep. So that's all I have to say about that, um, that verse. I, my wow. my name should be Rand, Randy from that one. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know when I became Randy. Do you guys have anything else to add to that? I thought it was excellent. <laughs> I don't have anything else to add. The, the wicked are going to be destroyed. They're not going to survive ever. All right? Not in the presence of God. Anyway, Amen. let's move on. Mm. Yeah, I was going to add something. Investigative but, nah. judgment. The SDA Church teaches that Jesus entered into the sanctuary in heaven on October 22nd, 1844 to begin investigative judgment upon those who have been forgiven to see if they are worthy of eternal life. Namely, are they keeping God's commandments? But the Bible never speaks of any such thing. It never speaks about Jesus entering into a different place in heaven on October 22nd, 1844. Since Christ ascended, he's already been in the Holy of Holies in heaven interceding for us. Plus, if God is determined who is worthy of eternal life based on keeping commandments that's opposite to the gospel we are saved by grace through faith not by keeping the commandments that's right <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what he said I, I i've never heard any official teaching from the church that said god is determining who's worthy based on keeping the commandments like that is not language that we would ever use um uh -huh. but like I said, this man is getting all the heavy hitters out, like all the heavy topics. Yes, he's he's I ain't front. like, mm -hmm. and and this is a video that Deontay chose. Why'd you choose this video, Deontay? Well, we got to pick the hard videos, man. Man, this guy, well, we, Deontay, yo. <laughs> we got to get challenged. Now, now we got to talk about the investigative judgment. I hope people are recognizing that what we do here is we go straight to the Bible. You know, a lot of people like to accuse Seventh-day Adventists of just following what Ellen White says. Uh, have, have we used an Ellen White quote? I don't think but so. But then what they're going to say in the comment section is, oh, but you guys are just regurgitating Ellen White. And I'm like, what Ellen White quote did we say? How about you refute what she says? I mean, if you're, if you're saying all these verses that we are using were written by Ellen White somehow... If you the verses. Anyway, that's a side conversation. Does the Bible talk about an investigative judgment? Yes. Let's talk about it. Yes. I created a PowerPoint, guys. So I'm right. gonna go in. Get him, Jay. <laughs> Does the Bible speak about a judgment to come? Okay. Well, when we look at Acts chapter 24, verse 25. This is what Paul said. He says, and as he reason of righteousness, temperance, and what? Judgment to Judgment come. Judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have convenient season, have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Paul preached about a judgment to come. What do we preach, right? We preach the judgment has come, right? When we look in the book, Daniel chapter 7, do we see a judgment before he comes? I mean, it's like, is this not in the Bible? It says this, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Who's the ancient of days? Help me out here, Randy. The father. God, the father. Okay. Whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wills as a burning fire. Mm -hmm. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Mm. Hello? Somebody? Yeah. There was a judgment that's yeah. set? So is yeah. God doing the judgment? Yeah. Well, yeah. God the Son, actually. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. 
I beheld nope. even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Wait a second. Is this judgment happening at the time that the beast is being slain and thrown into a burning flame? Yeah. Around that time? Mm -hmm. Would that be uh, in the last days? Yes. yes. So that means there's a judgment happening in the last days? Yep. Huh. Yes, sir. I saw in the night sir. visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Wait a second. This judgment is happening just before Jesus receives his kingdom? Mm -hmm. But we're making wow. this up. Until the ancient days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So there's a judgment just before the saints go Come into on. the kingdom? Come on. Come on. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. Huh? Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I could just... In right there. There is a judgment just before the second coming. Hello? Mm -hmm. Hello? There's a judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we being judged now? Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship come him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Water. The hour of his judgment is come. When you read the context of Revelation chapter 14, the very next thing that you see after this is that it's the second coming. Yeah, yeah. So it's consistent that before the second coming, there is a judgment that's going on. Now, we believe we're in the last days now. Yeah, because he, he don't come until the verse 20, right? Right. And notice it says, And the third angel followed them with a loud voice saying, If any man worship the beast, the beast is the same beast from Daniel chapter 7 that's around just before the second coming. Is this is we're in the last days? That's how we know that it's the judgment time now. That's one of the reasons why we know. But what yeah. about yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what about the investigative part? Come on, preacher. Come is there on. a is there an investigative judgment? Mm -hmm. It says, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which does what? Searches, Searches the hearts. Mm -hmm. Searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according yeah. to your works. So before yeah. he gives us what we deserve, he is searching. What is another word for searching? Shall we look that up, y'all? Yeah, let's do it. If you look in the concordance, it's the word erunawal, which means to Inve investigate. investigate. Wow. The Bible speaks about an investigative judgment? <gasps> yes. He said. Wow. Seventh day oh, wow. Adventists are making up an investigative judgment? The Bible says. He's investigating before giving you rewards. He says the judgment is happening now. Investigating judgment. On, it's right on. there on. on the screen. Mm. And on. the nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great and should destroy them, which destroy the earth. It says very plainly, He's going to give reward after the judgment. And he's going to give the reward after he investigates. Mm -hmm. These are Bible words. There is an investigative judgment. <laughs> These are the Bible's words. He's investigating mm -hmm. before he comes. We're not making this up. <sighs> Notice. And the temple of God was open in heaven. Come and on. there was seen in his temple... The ark, the ark of his testament. Come Where on. is he judging now? On, tell Lord, me something. Holy place. Come on, the Lord, ark Lord. of the testament was in the most holy place of the yep. heavenly sanctuary. Yep, yep, yep. The ark of his testament. What was inside the ark of his testament, y'all? The Ten Commandments. All right. <laughs> you already know. The ark of the testament was in the most holy place, right? Yep. 
Mm-hmm. How do we know that? It says this, Hebrews 9, verse 3. And after the second veil the t- of the tabernacle, was a tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. We call it the most holy place. Same mm-hmm. idea. Which had the golden center and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's the Ten Commandments that was on those the tables. Ten Commandments. Yeah. They're still in heaven. At the yeah. time that Jesus is judging, this is where he's judging. And that's what's in the ark. All ten of them. All right. Let's mm. move this thing right along. When was the ministry done in the most holy place? Okay. If we understand the sanctuary service, that tells us a lot about how God is doing things. When did people normally go to the most holy place? On the Day of Atonement. Right. When we look at Leviticus chapter 23, it says, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. An offering, mm-hmm. an offer, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in the same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. On the day of atonement, this was a day that everybody needed to afflict their souls. Why? Because God was investigating to see if you were afflicting your souls or not. Mm-hmm. There was an investigative judgment even on the day of atonement in the Old Testament. He was searching your hearts to see if you were holy or not, or what you claimed to be or not. Mm-hmm. Leviticus 16 tells us who was doing this work it says or the purpose of uh, this day it says and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and yeah. hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of israel for on that yeah. day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the lord the day of atonement was about a cleansing a what a cleansing cleansing hmm? If you just go on Google, this is what it says. It says, the Day of Atonement, like reasons for the Day of Atonement, just type this on Google. The Day of Atonement ritual provided a confident forgiveness of sins, as well as symbolic purification of the temple and the community. Oh, mm-hmm. a, a what? A purification of what? The, the temple. temple. What's another word for Ooh. purification? Tabernacle. Cleansing. A cleansing of what? A cleansing of the... What's another word for temple? Sanctuary. A purification of the temple can easily be translated as a cleansing of the sanctuary. Mm-hmm. You guys are just not excited about this. Like, I... <laughs> oh, no, we, we, we in. We locked in. We locked. <laughs> when is the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary? Well, <laughs> this is Randy's favorite verse. Daniel 8, 14. <laughs> and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Be cleansed. Oh, Come on, preacher. The day of atonement was about purification of the temple or cleansing the sanctuary. Come on. And what does the Bible tell us when that sanctuary is going to be cleansed? After 2,300 days. Now, I won't yeah. get into you the whole day for a year principle, but... Take our word for it for now, because this thing will go on forever if I have to explain this to you. That's how much 14. A day. Ezekiel yes, 4 verse 6. We use, you yes, time. we use a, a day for a year principle. And the reason why, I'll just explain the reason why real quick. Uh, when you study Daniel chapter 9, a portion of this 2300 day prophecy was cut off and it pointed to the Messiah. If you use 2300 literal days, six and a half years. You wouldn't even get. That's only six and a half years. The time yeah. that it was written, you would not get to the Messiah. But if yeah. 70 weeks was cut off, which is 490 days was cut off, you're not getting to the Messiah. But if you flip it and turn it into years, 490 years or 483, you go to the Messiah from the time that that decree was set in 457 BC. You add 490 years or 483 years. You go to the time of Jesus. And so this is why we know we need to use a day for a year because of yeah. Jesus Christ. He only yeah. fits when you use a day for a year principle. Yeah. We could talk about that um, on our Bible studies that we have every Saturday afternoon in the Facebook group. 
Anyway, so when we understand that because of Jesus, we use this time 457 BC because Daniel chapter 9 tells us this is where the decree was made to rebuild Jerusalem. Artaxerxes was that king, 457 BC. If we add to it the seven week prophecy, 490 years, then we come to the time of Jesus Christ. This mm -hmm. is why we believe this. And this is why we know we need to use a day for the year principle. Yeah. But if you continue to add the rest of the time, what year do you get to? From 457, you add 2,300 years total. What year do you get to? 1844. 1844. So the Bible is telling us after 2,300 years, we get to the cleansing of the sanctuary, mm -hmm. which is the work that was done in the most holy place. But what do we see Jesus doing in the most holy place? Judging. Dang. Judging and cleansing the sanctuary are the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So now, let's go to some Bible basics. Who's our high priest? Christ. Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not men. Come on, preacher. Come on. So what, when was the work of the high priest done? Now we know that Jesus is our high priest. Do Christians ever really consider this? And by Christians, I mean those who criticize the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventists are Christians in the truest sense of the word. Um, well, those who take the message seriously, because there's some professing Seventh-day Adventists that <laughs> I don't know if they're Christians yep. or not. But those who are, are truly Seventh-day Adventists are Christians in every sense of the word. Do we consider that he's our high priest and that the high priest had a very specific job? When was the work of the high priest done? Well, when we look on the Day of Atonement, it says this, Hebrews 9. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always in the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of his people. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 16, verse 2, Then the Lord and the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, which is what we call the most holy place, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die yeah. not. For I will yeah. appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. The main job of the high priest was on the day of atonement. That was the day that the sanctuary was cleansed. This is what Daniel 8, 14 says will happen after 2,300 years. Jesus yeah. will be doing this work. And we confirm it with Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, because we see when he's judging, he's in that very most holy place. Mm -hmm. And it shall be a statue forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, by the way, that's my birthday, the 7th month, 10th day. But that's a side point, July 10th, though. It's a different calendar. Anyway, that in the 7th month, on the 10th day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before yeah. the Lord. It was yeah. a day of cleansing all records, all things that had to do with sin. That's what that day was really about. Mm -hmm. What does the cleansing represent? Well, let's just talk about it. I'm almost done, guys. Oh. My name's Randy. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. When you're being cleansed, it means your sins are being blotted out. Does that make mm -hmm. sense, Deontay? Yep. Yeah. Let's keep going. This is all that David said. Against thee, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when you what? When thou judgest. I just... Hide thy face from my sins mm -hmm. and blot out all my iniquities. When is he doing this? When he's what? Judging. Judging. He's blotting out your sins when he's judging? Yep. When will God blot out our sins? Well, let's look at it. Acts 3. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Hold on. I thought Jesus blotted out all the sins at the cross. Oof. I thought that happened. I thought the whole work was done at the cross. What is Paul Peter preaching? 
Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hold on. So and he shall. So hold on. I just want to make sure. Can we just pause right there? So we're saying that these sins are blotted out before Jesus comes back? Is that what it's saying? Just the before time? he comes back. This is what it says. That your sins may be blotted out. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. How? Huh. Your sins are going to be blotted out before he comes back? I thought it was blotted out the cross, Randy. That's what they always told me. So it's blotted oh. out and then Christ shall be sent unto you or he comes back. Isn't that something? How does God view us when our sins are blotted out? I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine oh. own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put oh. me in remembrance. Let us plead together, declare thou, that thou mayest be justified. justified. When God blots out our sins, he calls us justified. Yeah. When are we declared justified? Deuteronomy 25. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. We are called justified when God judges us. Mm -hmm. Is God judging us to determine who is worthy? Now, this is the thing that he said that really messed me up. Is God doing this to determine that who's worthy? God knows everything. Psalms 139, one to four. God is not doing these things because he's trying to figure out if we're worthy or not. He knows everything. But then why is he doing this? Revelation 20 verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. God is a very strict record keeper. Everything is written down. Why? For, for records. The angels must know. Angels don't know what God knows, why this person is allowed in heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to look at these books and say, why wasn't this person allowed in heaven? It's not for God because God knows everything. But he does everything by the books so that there is no excuse. And I think that's all I can have I, to say. Can I, add a, can I add a verse to that? You don't mind? Oh, yes, preach it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Out of Psalms chapter 76, verses we're gonna have a part. We're going to have a part three for sure. Of course. Psalm 76, verse 8. Yeah, let's pull that up. Consider this. Consider this, John. It says, Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from where? From heaven. Oh, wait, hold on. From where? From heaven. The earth feared mm -hmm. and was still. And look at this. When God arose to judgment, what did he do? What's the purpose of judgment? To save all the meek of the earth. Yeah. Judgment is not supposed to be a fearful thing, guys. It's supposed to be something that we almost look forward to because he's wrapping things up so that he can save his people to bring us home with him. So I just wanted to add that yeah. in there because I think people have a fear of judgment. Um, you have nothing, no need to fear unless you're on the wrong side, unfortunately. But the purpose of judgment is for us to be saved, for God to save his people, not to condemn them. Amen. I, I just want to add on to that and... Um... And then we can move on. Um, something that you said, Jason, when people say like, oh, the entire work of Christ was finished at the cross. Can we look at that real quick? Can we look at sure. uh, John chapter 19, verse 30? John 19, verse 30? Let's do it. Yeah, John, no John 19, verse 30. Yeah, okay. So the Bible says, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You see, Adventists, there's no such thing as an investigative judgment. Jesus' work was finished at the cross completely. But can we go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 15? In Revelation 16, verse 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. And they see his sh his shame. So mm -hmm. Jesus is right here. He's speaking about his second coming. Mm -hmm. and it says, and he gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. Now let's look at verse 17. 
It says, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Out of the temple. Out of the temple. Hmm. Out of the temple. Mm -hmm. Of heaven from the throne mm -hmm. saying what? It is done. So hold on a second. How is it that Jesus said it is finished at the cross? But then in Revelation 16, 17, he's once again saying it is done. And he's mm. speaking from out of the temple, that heavenly temple that supposedly doesn't exist, according to our critics. Mm. Doesn't that mean Please. that after the cross, there was another work that Jesus had to do? Come right on. Before Peter. his second Come coming. Come on. And we know that it's speaking about his second coming because in verse 15, it puts it in the context of Jesus' second coming. There's a, there's a work that Jesus is doing right before his second coming. And we know that he's doing the work of the high priest. Revelation chapter 1 speaks about Christ wearing his priestly garments. Mm -hmm. So we know that Jesus Christ, he's doing the work of the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And he's standing in the midst. In Revelation chapter 1, it says that he was standing in the midst of the seven branch candlesticks. Mm -hmm. Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary doing a work right before he comes back. Yeah. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. another thing he said that I want to talk about. He said, um, God is determining who is worthy of eternal life based on keeping the commandments. That's opposite to the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith and not by keeping the commandments. Now, when we, when we um, disassociate the keeping of the commandments from grace, it means that we don't really understand grace. That's really all it means. Mm-hmm. Because what does the Bible say about grace? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You know, this is one of the most famous verses in all the scripture. Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. You see seven-day Adventists? You see? We are not saved by our works. We agree that you are not saved by your works. But what does verse 10 say? For we are his workmanship. His what? His workmanship? Created in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus unto what? Good works? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So what is the true purpose of grace? The true purpose of grace is for us to walk in holiness. Mm -hmm. It's for us to live holy lives. Ch mm -hmm. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says something similar in Titus 2 verse 11 it says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men so we we agree that it is grace that saves us but what is the very next word in verse 12 what's the very next word teaching mm -hmm. you know how we always say well what is grace grace is a is a free gift free undeserved gift that God gives us. And that's the only definition of grace that we use. But the Bible gives another definition of grace. In mm -hmm. verse 12, it says grace is a teacher. Mm -hmm. Do we all agree that grace is a teacher? Yes, what it does is. Grace, what does grace teach us how to do? It says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts that we mm -hmm. should live soberly righteously and godly in the present world the bible clearly tells us that the, the purpose of grace is to teach us how to be holy mm -hmm. in other words if you claim that you that you're living in the grace of god but you're not keeping but you're not striving or keeping the commandments of god do you really have the grace of god or do you really un even understand the grace of God? Mm. Because the purpose of the grace of God is for us to be like Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, the question then becomes, what is righteousness? Because if grace teaches us how to be righteous, you know, I'll give a quick commercial. I preached at a church three weeks ago. And I asked them, I was like, um, do you guys know what righteousness is? And then you could hear a pin drop in there. Because do we really understand what righteousness is mm. from the Bible? Let's go to Psalms 119, verse 172. 
Let's look at a biblical definition of what righteousness is. What is righteousness? With Psalms 119 verse 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy what? Commandments. I thought the commandments were done away with. <laughs> I thought the commandments were done away. So you mean to tell me that grace teaches us how to keep the commandments of God? So the purpose of grace is to empower us. It's the grace of God that empowers us to keep the commandments of God. Well, what about this? First John chapter two, verse one. So we know that keeping the commandments of God is righteousness. But is there another definition of righteousness? My little children, these things write I unto you that he sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So what does the Bible say about righteousness? The Bible says that the commandments of God are righteousness. But the Bible also says that Jesus Christ is the righteous. So what does that teach you about grace? It teaches you that grace, it teaches you that grace empowers us to live exactly how Christ lived. It empowers us to be righteous just how he is. And how is it that we do that? We live according to the keeping of the commandments of God, just as Jesus Christ did. Now, what does the Bible say in Romans chapter 6? What does the Bible say in Romans chapter 6, verse 1? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Hold on. What is the biblical definition of sin? What does 1 John 3, 4 say? Whosoever committed sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Did you guys catch that? Let's go back to Romans chapter six with that definition of sin in mind. It says, what then shall, what, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in transgressing the law? Shall we continue in breaking the commandments that grace may abound? Mm -hmm. God forbid. Mm -hmm. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The mm -hmm. purpose of grace is for us to die in sin. We have to die to sin so that we can walk in the newness of life. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, right, but under grace. And in verse 15, what, what then shall we say? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God shall we forbid. Sin? Shall we sin? Shall we? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God, God forbid. forbid. And you see, the problem with a lot of critics is that they will read verse 14, but they won't read the entire context. Because Paul, would, he, he understood that people were going to take this out of context, and he understood that people were going to misunderstand and misconstrue construe what he was saying. Right? He's not saying that us being under grace means that we can sin. No, he means the exact opposite. He means that us being under grace means that we keep the commandments of God. And what does Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 say? That the pay, that here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In other words, the true Christians who are under grace are going to be those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Amen. Well said. All right. <clears throat> Yo, uh, the chat is is pretty lively tonight. Um, I just want to yeah, I, I just bring up some little point here uh, in the chat. Where'd you go, comment? Where did you go? Um, ah, here we go. Hi, Kylan. Nice to meet you, Kylan Tobias. The 1844 investigative judgment is unbiblical. Wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to I say. Mean, how many verses did we show? You probably missed the whole thing, <laughs> my brother. But you can go back and look at it, though. Yeah. I mean, it's it's unbiblical. So, I mean, I guess all the Bible verses that I showed, they don't exist. Oh, but I think he also says masters of taking scriptures out of context. So, uh, here's what you can do. Join us 
on Saturdays at 5 p.m. Eastern. Come join us. Um, and I would love to hear why you say that. Um, we're pretty friendly people, Kyla. So Saturdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, come join us and show us where we got it wrong. But we showed a lot of verses that seem to support that there is an investigative judgment. So come show can us I, why we're wrong. Go ahead. Can I also respond to this comment? The Bible teaches holiness, but it's not by following the Ten Commandments. What does Romans chapter 7 verse 12, verse 12 say? It says, yes, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So I agree that the Bible teaches holiness, but to say that it's not the Ten Commandments would be to go against this very verse. It says that the law is holy and the commandment holy. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. You know, as a matter of fact, Romans chapter 8, it tells us that the law is fulfilled in us when we have Christ in us. When we're walking according to the Holy Ghost. Yeah. It says that the righteousness the righteous... of the law. Amen. The righteousness of the law must be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And in verse 8, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, or who walk or who have the law fulfilled in them, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So in other words, if we do not keep the commandments of God, that means that we're carnally minded and we're not walking according to the spirit. The Holy Spirit is the holiness spirit. He's the spirit that helps us to walk in holiness. In other words, keeping the commandments of God. Yeah. We'll be just like Jesus. And Jesus kept all the commandments. So he is our example. But because the carnal mind is enmity against God, who are the people that say there is no law? Carnal people. It's like carnally minded people. For it is not subject to the law of God. People will say, we're not subject to the law of God. Well, the Bible says the persons who say that are carnally minded people. We don't have to do the, the law of God. It's done away with. It was fulfilled in Jesus. Well, yeah, it's also fulfilled in us. In verse 4, it says the righteousness of the Lord might be fulfilled in us. We're walking just like Jesus walked. Um, yeah, 5 p.m., Kylon, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Write it down, brother. Put it in your phone, 5 p.m. Eastern, because we're in New York. Well, uh what's his name edmund's in florida but love to have you join you know come come set us uh set us straight guys we have time for one more question or do you want to save it for next week? Oh. what do you guys say one more oh um, huh? uh, you think we can get i know you you try to end usually by 9 30 so you think we can end that time no <laughs> not with the next question yeah that's what i'm saying so it's up to you yeah not with the next question Anyway, so let's just pause right here for today. Um, yeah, that next question is is going to kill me. It's a doozy. Yeah, it's a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, friends and family. Maybe we have about nine minutes. If anybody has any questions that they would like to ask us about anything that was said, um, my only my take. only thing is you know bring verses. Um, you know I I, I always hear critics they they say these things, but. I mean, where's the verse to back it up? Or, you know, give something. Um, just don't say you disagree with something. This is why we encourage you guys to come on Friday, on Saturday evening or, you know, Sabbath evening, as we call it. Because, uh, yeah, we would love to hear your responses to these uh, statements that we make. But I hope you come with some homework, please. Because uh, making statements, making, you know, outlandish statements, uh, you guys don't know what you're talking about or, you know, masters of context. My brother, Kylan, um, I'm not sure if you heard the actual whole video. I'm not sure where you thought we were trying to flip or strip the script or whatever. But I just hope that you guys, especially when you do come, that you're ready to also defend what you guys believe as well. So because we'll be ready. 
That's it. Amen. Ah, so any questions that you guys see? Um, hold up. Let me let me get to this one. Uh, so Michael, nice to meet you, Michael Smith. Uh, Adventist Defense League. Uh, why Adventists don't worship the one whose name is actually written in the fourth commandment? So whose name is actually written in the fourth commandment? Um, Exodus the chapter Lord? twenty, verse was eight. Hello. It says, "Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God." Uh, I don't really know what you mean. Like, yeah, we worship the Lord, so I'm not sure what you were yeah, trying to say. Can you can you kind of clarify what what you mean by that? Because we're worshiping the Lord and we're teaching people to do the same. So as a matter of fact, to add to that, there's a uh, Matthew chapter 15. Um, it says, ah, nine. there it is. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, it is. I think three, six, nine, it says, but you say, whosoever shall say to his father, or his mother is a gift. Uh, okay. Hold on. Verse six. It says, ah, here it is. And honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus you have made the commandments of God of none effect by your tradition. Right? Oh, here it is. Yeah, nine. But That's in just, vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. the commandments of men. So what we're trying to point people to do is stop doing the commandments of men and do the commandments of God and worship him in spirit and truth. You know, Jesus is looking for those people. Um, I think it says that in John chapter four, verse 24 or five, it says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So that's what we're trying to point people to. As a matter of fact, another verse, Isaiah chapter 59, it says this, uh, 58, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This is what we're doing. We're trying to show people that, hey, Stop transgressing God's law, you know, stop sinning, you know, trust God, believe in God, forsake sin, you know, perfect holiness by him leading. Um, yeah. And do what he says. That, that's what we're trying to tell people to do. So I don't, I'm not sure. So he says, uh, the son of Mary's name is not written in fourth commandment. I don't yeah, really I'm know not, what this means. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm not sure. What does this mean, Randy? Because you know everything, bro. <laughs> oh, wait, are you saying you have, you have an issue with the name with the, Jesus? I, I, that's what that, that's what it, it seems like. Well, I think I'm, I could be wrong, but it seems like he's referencing that that it's talking about the Father when it talks about the Lord. I'm assuming that it's not really talking about Christ. Um, that's that's my understanding. Um, yeah, but you know, it's yeah, funny. I, but I mean, I don't. What I can say though. Is uh, you know, the Bible says I think it's Psalms chapter ninety six verse nine. Can you go to Psalm ninety six if I'm correct? Hopefully I got it correctly. Psalm ninety six verse nine. Hopefully I got it right. What does it say there? It says worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, big before Him all the earth. But then, you know, Matthew seven, right? Matthew 7, right, verse 21. What does it say, Jay? One of my favorite verses. Matthew 7, 21. Go ahead, preacher. It's right there. It says, now who's speaking here? Jesus. Not everyone that saith unto me. What? Lord. Ooh, Lord, Lord. That's a great point, Randy. Lord. Mm. So the Old Testament talks about. You know, the Lord creating heaven and earth, or remember that whatever six day the Lord made credit made heaven and earth. Um, we have Psalm ninety six that says, "Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness." We have Him Himself calling Himself when making reference to Himself, "Lord, Lord, you know, shall I not enter into the kingdom of heaven." You also got Colossians. Go to Colossians one. I think go down to 17, 16, 17. All right. So talking about Jesus, who was the image of the invisible God, the first one of every creature, for by him all things 
created that are in heaven and earth, that in visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or domains or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Look at verse 17. I love that one. And he's before all things, and by him all things what? Consist. Consist. So, I mean, if you ask me, when it's talking about the Lord, um, I think there's a very clear or strong argument that the Lord is making reference to Christ. Yeah, I, I think it might be this. So the creator, Yah, as in hallelujah, all praise is 100% to the creator, Yah. So I guess what you're getting at, Michael, is that you're saying that um, it's very, very important that we say Yah when we're worshiping God. And so therefore, it's, uh, you know, making sure to say the right name. My brother, if you want to do that, by all means, do that, you know. The, I, if that makes you feel better, um, do that. You know, there was a situation in, in Numbers, I think it was Numbers, where they had a test to see if you were truly of Israel or something. And it's yes, like, say the name Sybil left. Is it Numbers? Uh, was it Numbers? No, it's probably not Numbers. It's probably Samuel 13 or something. I don't know. You'll find it for me. But just say the name Sybil left. And not, mm. what we learned from that story is that not everybody is able to pronounce every single name. But what matters most, right? Um, actually, there was a verse that I was thinking about. Psalms 138, verse 2. Are you familiar with this? I word that I have placed above his name. Absolutely. Come on. Psalms 138, verse 2. It says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Wait. So, brother, it's Michael, it sounds like you're saying, you know, his name is very, very important. That's very important when you worship him. But God is saying his word mm. is above all his name. So we, I think that's really the heart of it. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 19, when he comes back, look what it says about him. And mm -hmm. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. Mm-hmm. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were flame and fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. But should we just simply say, yeah? But the Bible says he, he has a name written that no man knew, he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. For me, again, if you want to make a big deal out of his name, go ahead. For me, the important thing is... Worshiping in spirit and in truth. Uh, I just want to add. Uh, God knows the heart behind. I was gonna, okay. Go ahead. I just want to. I'll let you. Uh, I'll just, yeah, I just want to add a just a quick verse to that. Um, Isaiah nine verse six. Um, uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It says, "Unto us a child, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name." His name shall be called what? Wonderful. Wonderful. Come on. Come on. Counselor. Keep going. The mighty God, the uh -huh. everlasting Father, the, the Prince, Prince of Peace. Come on, preacher. So, you know, Jesus Christ has many names. Oh, yes. And, you know, here's an example of, you know, we can call Christ wonderful. We can call him counselor. We can call him the mighty God. But we can, this is another Bible study. But each name of Christ is also an attribute of his character. So, you know, to just limit Christ to one name, to just Yah, um, you know, we don't necessarily have to, we don't have to do that. And as Jason said, I wouldn't make a big deal about doing that. We can call Christ whatever the Bible calls him, because those Here's things another. reveal something about him, his character. Here's, here's another name that we can call him. Um, where does it say? It says that his name, oh, here it is. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. So that goes into your point as well. Like he has many names. The most Can important I, thing yeah. is the person behind the name. Are we worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Yeah. yeah. I was going to bring up, yeah, and I was going to bring up actually Hebrews chapter one. Um, I love how um, the father spoke of his son. What one verse eight? 
It says, but unto the son, he said, thy throne what? Oh, oh God. God. You've been calling me. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus, God. The father's calling him, oh, calling the son, oh, God. It's forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Look at verse 10. And thou who? Lord. <laughs> In the beginning did what? Has laid the foundation, laid the of, the foundation earth. of the earth. Come on. And the, and the heavens. heavens are. Wait, hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait, hold on a second. Is this God talking about Jesus? Oh, oh, I, 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 you tell me. I don't. I mean, I don't need to make this stuff up, guys. It's there. Huh? It's there. But unto the Son, the Son yeah. is Jesus. He yeah. says, "Thy throne, O God." Yeah. So God yeah. is saying this about Jesus. He's calling him God. Number one. Yeah. Is forever and ever accepted righteousness is accepted by kingdom. He's saying about yeah. Jesus, you love righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, yeah. God, even your God, okay, so this is the Father, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Yeah. And mm -hmm. thou, meaning Jesus, you Lord, so the Father is even calling him Lord, in the beginning mm -hmm. has laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Yeah. So, so, he so is. here's my question Who do you think that's making reference to in Exodus chapter 20? Yeah, Jesus it has to be Jesus. Yeah. So, all right. Again, you know, this is not a this is not a point that we normally harp on, but I think again, as long as the name that you call him is out of respect and doesn't lessen who he is, you can call him wonderful counselor, as as Deontay pointed in Isaiah nine. You can call him Jehovah Rafi, Jehovah Nisi. Uh, all these things, but nothing diminishes who he is. Um, he's still Lord or whatever you want to call him. Just make sure that he's the one that you serve. And that's that. That's just my mm -hmm. take on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The spirit is the most important thing. Are you worshiping him in spirit and in truth? And in truth. Again, if, if you want to make a big deal of the name, if that makes you feel better, go ahead. It's all right, man. Ultimately, the Bible says he has a name that no man knew. So but don't when we see him face to face. But don't be so dogmatic where it is the only, you can only say it's one. Because if the Bible says that he's called by many, why are we pushing only one? And you cannot, you almost cannot, what's the right word? Um, um, You can't almost try to restrict people in a box to only call him one name when the Bible calls him by a few or even many. I don't think that's a fair assessment of the scriptures or, or for or something fair to be placed on other people as well. Um, if you choose to call him because that's the name that you feel the most connected to, that's fine. But don't place that injunction on other people because the Bible says something different to what your sentiments actually are conveying. So that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He said the creator Yah doesn't have a God. Thy throne, O oh God. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know I, how you get that. Hebrews one eight. Like God yeah. is calling him God. So I don't. I don't know. Anyway, we can talk about that Saturdays at five p.m. I mean, we're throwing this all on Edwin at this point. Edwin is going to go to, if you ever look at the shows on Saturday, like, I'm just sitting there like, <laughs> like, like this, watching Edwin just uh, answer a lot of questions. I wish I could help him out more, but the least I can do is just uh, <laughs> show the, the Bible verses for him, because Edwin, he, he's good at handling these type of questions. I'm still rather new at answering questions. Uh, guys, um, man, there's, there's a lot that we could definitely talk about, but we'll be here forever. So let's pause right here. Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, again, challenge in SDA this Sabbath at 5 PM, join the Facebook group. You know, we can have a lot more discussions in the Facebook group. It is the Advent Defense League. League means that there are others. It's not just the three of us, but there's a lot of very, very knowledgeable people in that Facebook group. Absolutely. Put a question up there and you are going to be having your discussion. And by the way, it's not just for people that agree. 
you know, there's rules. If you uh, agree to the rules, then fine. You know, uh, if you agree to the rules, it's going to be a very respectful conversation with everybody. And even if you agree or disagree, join the group. We definitely have a great time there. Uh, what else can we say? Um, this is the most important thing. Pray for us. What we do up here is not easy. Whether you agree with us or disagree with us, just know in our heart, we are just only trying to please Jesus Christ. And the Bible does say that all who live godly shall suffer persecution. Not saying we're living godly, but that is the goal. We're trying to you know, do what is pleasing to God. And by doing this, we do receive a lot of persecution. So pray for us, you know. Um, just know this about me. Like I'm the guy that smiles a lot. Randy's from Brooklyn, so he doesn't smile at all. But I smile a lot. And just know behind the smile is because of a lot of persecution. So if you see the bigger the smile, the more the persecution has been coming my way. And I'm very grateful to God for the trials and tribulations that he has put me through. So do it. <laughs> this is what we do. If you want to send us a video, email us at info.adventdefenseleague at gmail.com. Uh, anything else? If you want to support the ministry, you could do so. Press that that button down there somewhere, or do this. Go to this website. You know, it does help to keep the ministry going forward. Um, yeah. And and I'll and I'll say this. I guess to end this off, you know, when we study family, make sure. And I think Jay said it: studying in spirit and in truth, not with bias or preconceived notions. Study in spirit and in truth. And I believe if we do that, the Bible says in John chapter 7 that if any man wills to know of his doctrine, he will know it. And so as we continue to grow and strive um, in our studies through Christ, I believe we'll all come to that knowledge that will cause our salvation to be assured. So let's keep that up. Be blessed. Amen. Amen. Hope at lives. Thank you for this inspiring comment. You are opening up the scriptures to many like myself. Thank you. You know, this is what we aim to do. Like just sh mm -hmm. show verses. That's it. You know, we didn't open Ellen White once tonight, but we're going to be accused of preaching only Ellen White. Of course. Watch. Let's have a word of prayer. The same song every day. Yeah, that. Yes, that's that popular song. Let's pray. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this study tonight. Uh, we couldn't get through everything, so we're going to have a part three. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with us until we meet next week, which does not get any easier in these questions. Oh, so wow. please forgive us of our sins. Forgive us where we went wrong and guide us into all truth. Be with those in the comment section where they agree or disagree that we could all learn to do those things that are pleasing to you and live the life that you would want us to live, um, knowing that when you come, you will correct all things, um, whatever is right or wrong. You'll make it very, very clear. But help us to be living a life that's pleasing to you so that when you come, you will be happy to say, well done, my good and faithful servants. Um, and come join in heaven and have all the rewards that you have prepared for us. So please bless every single one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Saturday, 5 p.m. We will see you then. Good night, everybody.